horse racing. <sighs> I've contemplated making this video for over a month. It's been one year. Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel, Everyday Grace. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Sarah Grace. I live in a single wide, two bedroom, one bathroom mobile home in East Texas. It's been a hot minute since I did a sit down video with y'all. The last time I did one of these videos, it blew up <laughs> in a way I never expected. Most of y'all came from that video. I sat down to do a I'm moving video and explain why I was moving and all of that good stuff and I literally expected to just <laughs> at the time I had 150 subscribers so I expected for it to be me and those 150 subscribers to be sitting here and talking about that that day I never expected to have close to 50,000 people watch that video and to gain over 3,000 subscribers from that video. Not in my wildest dreams. I thought it was just going to be me and them 150 talking. So it's it's a little bit intimidating to sit down and do another sit down video with y'all because of how much it blew up last time. Like I said, it's been one year since my dad has passed and I'm, I'm shaking right now. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, and I think, I think I'm finally ready to tell y'all what has happened in that span of a year. What happened, how he died, the, all the information around his death, and pretty much where I'm at now, one year later. So bear with me. I said it in the last video whenever I did a sit down video. I'm going to say it in this video. I'm very much so an emotional person. I get, um, I, I don't like admitting it, but I do cry easily. <laughs> it's, it's not something I, I like to admit, but it is just who I am. Unfortunately, I actually don't like to show people my emotions. I'd rather hide them away. But with this type of stuff, you really just can't. I can't sit here and explain it to you without maybe getting tearful or getting upset or something like that. So if you're going to watch this video, please have patience with me. Y'all were so awesome last time. I got a lot of good feedback. I got a lot of bad feedback, but honestly, I'm okay with both as long as it's not just downright hateful. You don't have to agree with me. That is not why I have this channel. I don't, I don't expect everyone to agree with everything that I do and everything that I say. That's not how communities work. People are going to have different opinions and that's okay. So I'm going to try to be as clear and direct as I can. If y'all have watched me before, you know I'm not very good on staying on track, but we're going to try. So it was July 17th, 2023. I woke up that morning and I was getting ready for a brand new job. And this is it may not be, like, it may seem so little to other people, but I could go on and on about my backstory. I've, I came from the struggle. I fought the struggle. I feel like that I climbed out of financial struggle. I'm obviously not rich. I live in a trailer, but I am definitely blessed with what I've had, y'all. I've had absolutely nothing before, and I remember those days. So, without getting off track too much, it was, I was waking up for a brand new job. I was orienting for a local hospital. It was a clinic job and it was for cardiology. I was going to be working in a cardiology clinic. I woke up that morning and I got dressed and I was super excited. I had worked my butt off to get to this point in life where I could have a day job because I had worked night shift for so long. I mean years and years I worked night shift, years and years I sacrificed my life, my time to get ahead to where I could support my family. I made those sacrifices to get me to where I was in that moment. I got dressed and I headed to the hospital and I was in the middle of my orientation 
I'm trying to figure out how to explain this, so forgive me if I'm, I pause a little bit. I really, because it's, it's just so much replaying in my mind. And honestly, y'all, I feel nauseated trying to explain this. My, um, my anxiety is way high, so you'll have to forgive me. Just let me work through it real quick. I was in the middle of orientation, and I got a phone call from Milena. If you don't know, if you haven't watched some of my videos, Milena is my sister. I have four sisters total. Three of them have the same dad as me. And that's who, like, you'll hear about in this story. So I got a phone call in the middle of orientation from Milena. And I knew I had to answer it. So I stepped out of orientation. Now this is a big hospital I'm orienting at. I stepped out of orientation and took the phone call. And she gave me an update on what was going on. And I said, okay, call me. Whenever you get another update, let me know. So we hung up. I, I made sure my phone was on a ring so I could hear it. And not even, I went back into the orientation Luckily, nobody got mad at me or anything like that. Nothing crazy, because it was just a big orientation. I was able to step out with no problems. And about 10, 15 minutes later, I got another phone call. And my heart sank. Because you see, that morning, my dad was going in for open heart surgery so I step out of the orientation room, I answer the phone, and she says, Sarah, you need to get to the hospital right now. I said, what's going on? She said, I don't know, but I'm scared and I don't want to be here alone. The nurses are scaring me. I don't know what's going on. They won't tell me what's going on. So I'm in the middle of this big orientation and I'm trying to figure out, because it's not just like I can hop in my car and go. You have to shuttle, they call, they call them shuttle buses, you have to shuttle to the hospital. My car was blocks away. So I'm in the middle of the orientation on the, the hallway and I'm crying. I'm trying to pull myself together because I'm already panicking because I'm just fearing the worst. And I'm trying to figure out how am I going to go in here and tell them, hey, I got to go. Something's wrong with my dad. Luckily, I think it was God had sent a, an angel out there for me. He had sent um, one of the women who were over the orientation and she had seen me crying in the hallway and she was like, are you okay? And, and I was trying to hold back my tears and trying to calm myself down. I said, I really need to go. I said, I have, I've had a family emergency. I need to leave. So she went and grabbed my stuff and I asked her, I said, how do I get a hold of the shuttle to take me to go to my car so I can, you know, drive to the other hospital? Because the hospital I was at was the next door hospital to where my dad was at. So the hospital that I was at was right here. And then the hospital that he was at was like right here. I couldn't walk it. I had to drive it. But it was close enough to be next door. They were both massive hospitals. And the lady said, don't worry about it. I'll take you in my car. Where are you at? Where's your car at? So I kind of told her. I didn't know like because they have them labeled from like one to five. Um, where you can park at for like guest parking until you get your actual parking so I gave her directions on where I needed to go to get to my car and I get to my car um, I, I tell her thank you I get to my car and I'm 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 I am panicking I'm crying I can't control my crying I'm trying to calm down I need to drive to this hospital that's right next door but I need to calm down before I do it because I'll end up getting into a wreck. And that's what my sister had said. She said, you need to calm down before you get here. So I gave myself a couple of seconds to gather my bearings pretty much. And I turned my car on, drove to the hospital, and I parked in the uh, parking garage at this massive hospital. And my future brother-in-law, y'all have seen him on here a couple of times, Zach, he met me in the parking garage. Again, I'm crying. I'm trying to control my breathing. He meets me out there and he takes me to where the waiting room is with my sister. I walk in this waiting room and it's just Milena, Vicky, my other sister, and Zach and me. It's this big, sterile, white waiting room and 
I'm talking with Milena and I'm trying to figure out what's going on and I'm playing the waiting game. The hospital has a phone, it's like a house phone on the wall and that's how they were calling Milena. We're waiting to get a phone call from the surgery team and I think we waited about an hour and the nurse comes out. And if you don't know, uh, you haven't been on here, I'm a nurse myself. I'm an LVN. Milena is also a nurse. My other sister Heather, she wasn't there at that point in time, but she is a nurse. So you can imagine two to three nurses were grilling the nurse that came out. I'm not gonna lie, we were grilling her. What is going on? Don't beat around the bush, tell me what's going on. And if you don't know about nursing, nurses can't diagnose, they can't tell you. They, they have to let the doctor be the one to tell you really. But obviously I'm not thinking logically at this point and she wouldn't say much, bless her heart. <laughs> she wouldn't say much, but she's like, come in this room. It's a room right next door to where we were at. And she said, come in this room. Um, this is, we're gonna talk to you in here. And she takes us into this little bitty cubicle of a room with a couple of chairs in it. And she shuts the door and I'm, I'm, I'm grilling her. I'm like, what is going on? It, is he okay? And she says, he's critical. That's all she says. She says the doctor's gonna be in shortly and he's gonna talk to y'all more. So at this point, I can feel my heartbeat in my ears, my, I remember getting so nauseated that I grabbed the little trash can that was in the room and I remember holding it. I thought I was gonna puke. Me, Milena, and Vicky were all discussing, trying to figure out. <sighs> I don't know what we were trying to figure out. And honestly, I don't remember much of the conversation that went on before that. I just remember thinking and praying, God, please don't do this. I remember I kept saying, I kept repeating, God, please don't do this to me. Please don't take him from me. Please don't do this to me. God, please don't do this to me. I kept repeating those words over and over and over again. Milena had Heather on the phone and obviously all of our anxiety is skyrocket high. The doctor hasn't come in yet, we're waiting. And the doctor came in and you can just see it on all of their faces. You can see it. And he was an older man and he comes in and he sits down and I don't, again, I don't really it's kind of a blur because my anxiety was, like I said, through the roof. But I remember him saying, it's not looking good. He tried to explain something and we were trying to figure out what was going on. He was in the middle, my dad was in the middle of open heart surgery. And we were trying to figure out what was going on and the doctor couldn't give me a straight answer. He said, I just don't know. It's not working. We've tried different things. We've tried, they talked about a balloon and I don't know much about it and I haven't been able to even to, to this day study it because it just brings back so much PTSD for me. Cause I, I do, I have PTSD from this specific time in my life. And so he's discussing it with us. And then my, Milena, she goes, is he gonna make it out? And the doctor says, no. I don't believe he will. And I tell you, my heart sank. I remember clutching the trash can and just feeling like I'm fixing to heave everything that I ate that morning out. They couldn't pull him off the machine. I remember them kept saying they couldn't, he wouldn't stabilize enough to get off the machine. Whatever p was pumping his heart for him, he couldn't, he wasn't stabilizing to get off of it. And I remember I'd gotten on the ground and I was trying to breathe and I was begging God. I said, God, please don't do this to me, please. My sisters were panicking around me. I remember when the doctor said that Heather wasn't there at the hospital. She was on her way, but I just remember her screaming over the phone. I remember her screaming, no, please. And just the agony in her voice. I remember Vicky slamming her hands on the the chair over and over again. I remember Melina, the shock in her face. The doctor had walked out of the room and said he needed to go check on 
check on my dad and um, get him stabilized and then we can go back there. And I remember just begging God, don't do this to me, please God, I'll do better, I'll be better, I'll be a better daughter, I'll do anything you want. I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to, I was trying to make a deal with God. In those, in those few moments, I was trying to strike a deal with God to keep him on this earth. I would do anything he wanted. I'll do better. I'll be better. I'll be a better daughter. I remember those words. I remember repeating those words. I remember clutching to that trash can on the floor, repeating those words. I'll do better. I'll be better. And a few minutes later, the doctor walks in and he has two big nurses behind him and he says he just passed I'm sorry and it gets blurry at this point in my memory I remember hearing screaming I remember screaming and the nurses were there. The doctor had quickly walked out of the room. The nurses were there. And if you don't know, a lot of times nurses will, it's, it's ugly to say, but they'll, they'll stay with the family as pretty much like a bodyguard to make sure nobody does anything crazy. And I can't say that I blame them because whenever you're in such a stressful situation as that, I get it. I remember I threw the trash can, I remember throwing it, and I was screaming, and I couldn't breathe, or at least felt like I couldn't breathe. Um, I was hyperventilating, and I just remember sobbing on the ground. And I, th I'm, I think Vicky had left the room first to go back there and see him. I don't remember where Milena is at this point. I know at one point I was crying so much and hyperventilating. I, my arms started to curl up like this and they were locking up and I couldn't breathe and I kept saying, ow, ow, it hurts, it hurts. And the nurse was like, you need to breathe. And I remember getting in the nurse's face and screaming, I know, and I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. And I remember Milena saying, I, she's never done this before. Um, she needs to go to the ER. And I, I remember screaming at Milena. I said, no, I don't want to go. And I was just, just wailing and I couldn't control my breathing and it was hurting and they were locking up and I just remember saying I want to die I remember those words coming out of my mouth and I remember crying I'm sorry I'm sorry eventually I was able to get my breathing under control and my limbs started to loosen to where I could open my hands. They weren't contracting anymore. And I sat there for a little while and the nurse, he stayed there with me. Eventually I had um, gathered myself enough. I remember saying, can I see him? And they said, yes. They said, are you okay? I said, yes, I'll be good. I'll behave. They said, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, are you okay to stand up and go? Do you need a little bit more time? I said, no, I want to see him. So I stood up with the help of two nurses and they helped me. They helped me walk down that white hallway and I felt my feet shaking out from under me and at one point I thought I was going to fall but the, the nurses were there, they were helping me, they were holding me up, helping me walk 
and they took me into a darker room he was in he was in an ICU room I think and um at one point I know there was like a priest that had met with me or something he, he somehow I don't remember exactly how it happened but a priest ended up being by my side and the one that was holding me up as I walked into the room and I walked up to him, my dad he was laying out on this bed and even though he looked like he was sleeping I knew I knew the doctor had told me he was gone, but I felt it in my heart. He was gone. I walked up to him on this side of the bed with the priest holding me on my other side. And I remember he was praying and, and talking and I don't remember what he was saying beside me. I just remember looking at my dad and thinking, you just called me this morning. You just called me at 5.05 in the morning and you told me that you loved me. You said, baby, they're taking me back for surgery. I love you. And the last thing that I had said to you was that I love you too, daddy. Those were the last words that you heard me speak. That you heard me say. I remember reaching my hand out and I remember touching his forehead and it felt like electricity went up my arm and I snatched my hand back and I, I remember saying he's not here anymore it felt like it burned touching him the priest was was he was praying and he was you know telling me in quiet voice he was saying no he's not here he's in a better place but if, if anybody has been through a traumatic death, um, experienced, you know, a loved one going through a traumatic death and having to live through it, that you know it's very hard to separate them, who they were, and their life, and their soul, the person that you knew, to be gone. And I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but I just could not wrap my mind around it. I remember seeing him there, and I knew he was gone. But I couldn't accept it. The next week was a blur after that. I remember I ended up, I had to drive myself home. Jimmy had met me at the hospital, but he had drove his truck there and everybody had their vehicles they had to drive home so somehow I had managed to drive myself home and then of course I lived right next door to my dad so I remember pulling up in the driveway and thinking he's never he's never gonna come home we were supposed to be planning for his funeral um, but it was mainly my oldest sister, Melina, that planned. Um, there was, you know, we had meetings and stuff, all of us would get together, but I wasn't really there, if that makes sense. I wasn't present. My body was there, but my mind was in total mourning just mourning for my father, my dad, the person who had raised me. We had had the funeral that next week. We had, had to wait a week because he, his siblings were coming from Oklahoma to go to the funeral. My dad's siblings. And it, it was a beautiful funeral. My sister, Milena, actually paid for the whole thing and just a superwoman is what she is. 
coming in to save the day every time. It was so beautiful. He was buried in a in a casket that was made from salvaged barn wood. Like literal barns, they would tear him down and use the wood as making a casket and it fit him so well. And it was beautiful and the service was beautiful and all of us got to speak and to say say things about him and it just it couldn't have been more perfect for him and so many people showed up he was so loved by so many I had made sure to stay until they lowered him in the ground It was me and Vicky. We were the last ones out there. I wanted to see it through. I wanted to see him through. I felt a protection over his body, like I needed to protect it, which doesn't really make sense. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's how I felt. So I made sure to see him through until they lowered him into the ground. I had went home and I slept. I took a nap. I didn't do much that day after the funeral. Woke up the next day and I turned 24. We buried him a day before my 24th birthday. The next few weeks were a blur. The cardiology clinic that I had gotten hired on for messaged me and gave me their condolences. Um, I had gotten a phone call shortly after my dad had died and I had told them that he had passed. And um, they had messaged me their condolences and um, and this is, uh, I had messed up that day. I should have been at the hospital that morning with my dad instead of doing the orientation. I should have postponed it. I should have postponed the orientation and went to that hospital. I have a lot of regrets that day. I did a lot of things wrong that day. I should have been there and I wasn't. But I thought I was going to see him again. I didn't think that that was going to be it. I thought he was going to make it through it. The doctors seemed confident. I talked to the doctors and I, one even blew me off. He was like, no, we're not going to talk about that right now. It was, that's a whole nother ordeal I don't want to get into, but we had all made mistakes that day. All of us, all of us girls. Mine was not being at that hospital. Whenever he went back for surgery, I should have told them. I should have told them that no I can't do orientation on this day but I had planned it before it doesn't excuse it but they gave me three weeks and what I wanted to do was to quit I don't want to go to the hospital and work for cardiology patients after my dad had just died in open heart surgery That's the last thing I wanted to do. But of course, like anything else in my life, I sacrifice myself and who I am to provide. That is a downfall of mine. And it's not nobody's fault but mine. I didn't have another job lined up. This was a huge, major hospital in my area. If I had just quit, uh, I wasn't thinking clearly back then because I'm pretty sure I could have told them, hey, I just can't work for y'all. But then I had done the orientation that morning. So would that be quit? Would I be banned from working for that hospital forever? I don't know. But those were the thoughts that were going through my mind, which shouldn't have been what was going through my mind. I had just lost my dad. And that's what I was thinking about. It didn't make sense. 
but my dad had always been a provider and I had always learned from him to be a provider, to never fail your family. My husband wasn't, at the time, he wasn't making enough money to support us on his own. So what did I do? Can you guess? I sacrificed myself and my mental health. And I went and I started working at the cardiology clinic. I worked there from August to the beginning of November, I think. And every single day I'd wake up. I'd hate where I was going. I'd hate who I was. I'd hate how I was living. And I'd go to work and I'd put on a fake smile on my face and I'd act like I wasn't losing my mind at the moment. And I'd see all those open heart surgery scars and I'd sit there and as bitter and nasty as this sounds, I was pissed that they lived and my dad didn't. I'd get off work and I'd go to my car and I'd scream and I'd cry and I'd think of the worst things possible that would go through my mind and thinking back it's all a big blur that's all I remember I remember seeing the scars I remember the thoughts that would cross my mind I remember the bitterness I had in my heart the anger I had towards God the many conversations that I'm now embarrassed to say that I had with God I remember at one point it had gotten really bad. It was nighttime, I don't even remember, maybe in September or October, so it had been a couple of months. I remember I had gotten out of the shower, I was in just a regular robe, I had nothing else on, not no underwear, I know this, this is graphic, but I just want y'all to understand. Um, I didn't have any underwear, I didn't have anything else on besides my robe. Just gotten out of the shower for the first time that I'd taken a shower because at that point I wasn't taking very many showers, I wasn't taking care of myself. I had, but I was faking trying to be okay because I was working at this cardiology clinic. And don't get me wrong, those people at the cardiology clinic were great. I had, a, I had good people I was working for, but it just was not a good environment for me, obviously. I'd gotten out of the shower. And I don't remember what had caused the argument, but me and Vicky had gotten into an argument. And it was a heated one over the over the phone. She had messaged me something, and I, again, I don't even really remember what the argument was about. But I remember I picked my phone up. I was in the kitchen, and I picked my phone up, and I chunked it in the living room. And I just screamed, and I ran to my room, and I remember falling on my knees on the floor, just crying and hyperventilating, and I couldn't breathe. And Jimmy had just gotten out of the shower too. We had taken a shower together and he ran in the room and he said, what's wrong? What is going on? And as embarrassed as I am to say it, LJ was there too. And LJ came in the room and I had scared him. He said, mama, what's wrong? And I just remember wailing right there, right there. And I was just screaming and crying. And Jimmy had told LJ, he said, go in there, go in there, it's okay, Mama's okay, she's gonna be okay. And I remember just crying and crying and just thinking, why, why, why? Why are you putting me through this, God? What did I do to deserve this? And Jimmy kept trying to figure out what was going on, you know. Um, I... Looking back, I could tell I was scaring him too. I was scaring myself though. I was scaring me too. It wasn't just him, it was me. I... And at one point, he was doing something. He had went to go do something and he went to go pick up my phone and to see if it was broken. And I had gotten up and I remember I'd grabbed my keys and the way our bathroom and such is he went through the bathroom to come into the room and I went to the hallway and I took off running and I ran outside and I ran to my car barefooted no clothes on besides my robe 
and I remember starting my car and I sped off and he, he tried to stop me but I wasn't listening and I remember I knew where I was going to go but what was scaring me what was going through my mind I knew where I was going to go I was going to go see dad I'd been going to see him at his grave I'd been talking to him even though you can't talk back and I was going to tell him what I was planning I remember what it felt what it felt like I thought this is it I've lost my mind I was laughing like a maniac the whole way there tears pouring out of my eyes and I'm sitting here laughing my head off pull up to the cemetery I pull right up to his grave in my car and I remember just getting out and just laughing laughing tears pouring out of my eyes and I said yeah this is it dad I'm fixing to kill myself I can't do it no more I'm done I'm fixing to go see you and I remember there and just standing there laughing and it was it's crazy thinking back now because it felt like, in my mind, it felt like one half of my brain, a very, very small piece of me, was scared. And then most of all the rest of my brain was this crazy maniac that was laughing, thought it was funny. Oh, I'm fixing to be done. This is fixing to be over anyways. And I just remember that very small piece saying, please don't do this don't do this and it is it is embarrassing for me to sit here in front of y'all and tell y'all this I have a husband in there and I've got a kid in there and my son is my whole world but the thing that kept going through my mind is I am broken I cannot be fixed and I'll be damned if I drag him down because of me because I can't fix myself so what good am I here? And those were the thoughts that I had going through my mind. I didn't want to leave my son. I didn't want to leave my husband. I loved both of them. But what can I do if I'm broken and I can't be fixed? What good am I to them? I remember I kept thinking and saying, I'm not going to let it affect LJ. I won't let it affect LJ. And the small piece of my mind that was sane and was thinking that was thinking rationally was saying go to the hospital admit yourself in the hospital and get help I was sitting there with no clothes on barefooted in the middle of the night at a cemetery in front of my dad's grave laughing and telling him my plans. You know how upset my dad would be if he was alive and I had said that to him? I'm embarrassed for having to say this. I didn't end up admitting myself that night, but by the grace of God, I somehow ended up back in my car whenever I was headed there to my dad's grave I was speeding like a maniac <sighs> I guess I I guess I had a psychotic break I don't know I'm lucky I'm lucky now that I didn't you know I didn't get killed by the way I was driving or I didn't hurt anybody and I, I deeply regret my actions but somehow I ended up back in my car on my way back home and I woke up that next morning and I got ready for work and I went to work. That was like a changing moment for me um, that night after that had happened. I had realized two things. I cannot keep this job. I cannot keep sacrificing myself for a job to provide for my family. No matter what happens, I cannot do that anymore and that I need to get help. I don't remember how soon after I'd put in my notice, but 
I had put in my notice for work. I told them I was leaving. I told Jimmy. It was like the next week we had talked about it and I had, um, I pretty much told him that I cannot continue working. Um, and, um, I'm, I'm not mentally healthy enough to continue working and I think he knew. I think that he knew shortly after that I had scheduled an appointment for a PCP appointment just to go in and I was going to pretty much get help. I'd scheduled my appointment and I didn't really specify on the appointment what was going on. I just said I'm dealing with depression and it was like two, two weeks out I think that I had to wait to be seen and I remember that day. The day finally came I was able to go in for my PCP appointment and I was so nervous. I was so so nervous. And again, like I said, I have a hard time controlling my emotions and I get really embarrassed whenever I show my emotions. So you can imagine me walking into this clinic and trying to tell this provider that I've never met that I'm, you know, I'm, just, I'm setting up care that I, that I need help. And my PCP was so good. She was so understanding. She spent, like, if you've ever worked or you know how clinics work, they've got to get you in and they got to get you out. She spent like an hour with me just talking to me and trying to piece together everything that had happened because so much was going on. I was, my dad had died on the table in open heart surgery. I was working in a cardiology clinic. The day that I had gotten hired, he had died in surgery. And I was still working for the clinic and I had told her, I know I can't keep doing this, but I said, I need to provide for my family. And she, she said, Sarah, you can't provide for your family if you're thinking about you can't even be here. Like if you're thinking about not even being here anyways, how are you gonna provide? What are you gonna do for them? She wanted to admit me into the, um, into a psych ward, pretty much, which is completely understandable. Um, looking back now, I, I probably needed to be, actually yes, I did, I did need to be um, admitted, but I refused and I told her no. I said I need to provide for my family, I can't leave my son, you know, I can't leave my husband and she, like she, had, like she had said before, she had said, you know, you have to take care of yourself first because if you're thinking about not being here, how are you going to help them? So. We had had a very long conversation and oh my gosh, my PCP is so good. She is amazing. And we had finally came up with a care plan. She put me on a strong antidepressant and gave me a bunch of recommendations for therapy and it was a uh, priority. I don't know how you pretty much say it, but it was pretty much like it was priority. I had to call and get in and, and be seen. So I left that day and I got put on um, an antidepressant and that's, that was another, so the night that I had pretty much lost my mind was a breaking point for me and that day was pretty much a let's try to piece it back together. I had started my antidepressant and immediately if you, if you're on an antidepressant and you've ever taken one, you know that it takes a little bit for, it takes about um, a couple of weeks to feel the full effects of it. But I, whenever I tell y'all, immediately it felt like, and this is what I told my doctor too, I said before I was taking it, it felt like I had had 20 different voices in my head and they were all screaming trying to make out what this new life, what had happened, what had happened to me what had happened to my dad. And as soon as I took my antidepressant, it felt like all of them were quiet. They all got quiet. And I was able to sit there and think. And for the first time in months since my dad had died, I was able to think, to finally think without all of my thoughts screaming. It was just one I could hear just one thought and it wasn't screaming anymore and oh my gosh it was like a weight lifted off my shoulders 
I know that some people on here do not believe in antidepressants and that is completely okay, but I want you to understand that this right here is not up for debate. I'm not going to argue with you in the comments about it. I understand if you don't feel the same way, but I am not debating about it. It's non-negotiable. That's not the point of this video anyways. I just want to throw that out there. So I had gotten on my antidepressant and I am still currently on an antidepressant. And it is one of the best things that I could have done for myself. It helped me tremendously. I was able to think clearly. So shortly after that, I can't remember exactly when, I'm pretty sure I had put my two, I actually did three weeks. I did a three weeks notice for my job. I told them I just can't do it anymore. They knew what was going on, um, or the manager did. A lot of people that worked there didn't know. But um, I told her, I just, I can't sacrifice myself anymore for a job to provide for my family. I didn't tell her how bad it got. Nobody knew. Very, very, very few people knew. Not even my sisters knew what was going on with me. Eventually I told them, but they didn't even know at that time. And then I was thinking, well, I can't work. And if you know me, you would know that I'm all, I've always been a provider. You can ask my family, I've always provided for my family. So sitting back and not doing nothing, as not, that wouldn't have been good for me. So I needed something to do. So I decided that I was gonna do YouTube. I thought, if I can't work and I can't do anything right, at least I can do one thing that nobody has control over besides me. It's not a job. It's just me doing me, doing whatever I wanted to do. So I bought a $100 camera and I started to do YouTube. <laughs> it was very, very little interaction at first, very few people talked to me or commented and I got so excited whenever I got my first 10 um, subscribers and it was around it was Halloween was it Halloween I think it was Halloween whenever I did my first video I actually ended up going back and deleting it I had gotten spooked by somebody but later on I had talked to the lady and she ended up being very sweet it wasn't anything that I was thinking um, but I ended up deleting my first two videos. So my first video that you actually see whenever you go to my page is a, a Christmas decorate with me. That wasn't actually my first video. My first video was like a clean with me. Regardless, I'd gotten very little interaction, but the interaction that I did get, I was just excited to talk to somebody and to have something to do was my main thing to keep my mind busy because in November I stopped working completely and I've never done that. I've always either been doing school or working. I've never just done nothing. I've always worked so I needed something to do and it gave me something to do. It kept my mind busy. And then I did the Christmas float video which is you know in honor of my dad and that kept me busy for a while um but really the winter months it was hard on my family it was hard on jimmy he was i feel so guilty he was working triple the amount of hours just to try to keep up and he never complained once he understood he was very understanding with me and through those winter months I pretty much just woke up did something for YouTube and edited or made a video or something like that and I slept that's pretty much all I did I'd sleep and I'd do YouTube and I'd I'd go and help my grandmother. That that was my life. I was helping her, doing something for her, bathing her, you know, cleaning, something like that. Doing YouTube and sleeping. I was sad at the time, don't get me wrong. It was still, I was still very much so depressed, but that was like the beginning of me 
figuring out how to live without my dad. The very first baby steps. My dad was my everything. He was my rock. He was my best friend. If I needed to do something, Dad, come on, I gotta go do something in town. Come with me. He was right there with me. <laughs> Dad, I need to fix something. Can you help me? He was right there helping me. Anything and everything, he was right there. LJ, they were best friends too. He, LJ spent so much time with him. So those winter months, that's what I did. That's all I did. And then spring rolled around and our finances got so tight, it got to where I had to go back to work. And it had been three, four months maybe that I didn't work and it was just, it was getting to be too much. We had depleted our savings and I just, I, I had to go back. I was a little bit nervous. I know I didn't want to go back to a clinic and honestly, I had mentioned this in one of my previous videos. Honestly, I don't even think I want to do nursing anymore at this point. I, I work as a nurse, which is fine. Um, honestly, I didn't even think I wanted to do nursing anymore and I actually still feel like that. But I did end up applying for home health. I worked for home health for many years before um, I had ever went to a clinic. That was my first clinic job and that did not go very well. I did home health for many years and so I applied as a home health nurse and it was about maybe a, maybe a week. I'd heard back from the company that I had applied for and they're like yeah you can know you can come in and do an orientation and blah 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 we'll find you what you want I was very set on I did not want to work weekends I did not want to work night shift because that is literally all I did and I didn't think that would help my depression because it, even before my dad had passed it was hard work night shift so I told them up front nope no weekends no night shift so they had done a couple of matches with me and then I had found a match that was close to my, um, close to where I lived and it was a family. It's, like I said, she's a single mom and it was a perfect fit. Um, she is a nurse so she pretty much was like, well, what can you work? And I was like, I can work Monday through Thursday. At first it was Monday through Wednesday because I was picking up Thursdays in another house. And then I dropped that house because they had already had their nurses. They were just doing that to help me. And then I went full time over Monday to Thursday with her. And it had worked out perfect. And that is actually where I'm still currently working. I was nervous about going back because I had, it was just, everything was so traumatic in the past year. And um, it was good though. It was, it was, it was really what I needed because like I said I was I was sleeping that's one thing about my antidepressant that I had a problem with at first is I was sleeping so much maybe it was just the depression too I don't really know but I was sleeping so much and I wasn't doing anything it was good it was good that I went back and it was good where I went back to I'm very thankful like I said I feel like God placed me in that home for a reason that that family needed me and I needed them and I am thankful. So I went back to work. I would started working full time and I'd forgotten to mention that um, you, you know obviously if you've been here for a second you know I had found out over the winter time that I would have to move off of the land that I grew up on. So I had that going on as well and it was just I, I, there's a whole nother video if you haven't watched that video there's a whole nother video about it it explains everything and what was going on and what happened so if, if you haven't watched it go over there and watch it I really don't want to go into too much detail about it but it's where I was raised I grew up at and I had to leave and that was a another huge change you know um, so we moved we moved to my sister's land Milena and this is where we're at now. This is where you see me at in the videos now. And it has been a year. It has been one year now. And I'm kind of dealing with 
I think a little bit of depression with it being this time of year. I'm really focused on the fall. Uh, first of all, the fall is my favorite time of year. But secondly, I think it's more of I just don't I don't feel comfortable in the summertime. So because of everything that happened, I don't want to be in the summer. So I'm focused on the fall. I'm excited for the fall. I'm grateful, you know, for for just another day. But um I, I haven't been wanting to do much here lately. That's why I haven't really done much on the inside of my house in my videos. I've just been I don't know. I don't feel like cleaning. And Jimmy does help. I know people comment and say, why don't your husband do it? My husband does help. He does. But he can only do so much. And I've always done most of the cleaning, which is fine. I mean, he does clean too, but, and LJ helps too. He actually helps pick up and clean too. But I, I'm the one that does like the deep cleaning and making it look tidy and pretty in here and I just haven't felt like doing it. So that's been kind of hard. All that to say is I am here now, one year later, and I survived what I thought would kill me. I really thought it was going to kill me. Looking back. It's honestly scary. All of it and my mindset was very scary. I never want to go back to that place again. And I have a lot of guilt and embarrassment, but I'm here and and I made it. As far as the medication goes, I am still on my medication. My doctor tried to put me on a PTSD medication for nightmares because even now I still frequently have nightmares about my dad and about everything that happened and it's very hard whenever you're trying to be productive during the day but you didn't sleep at night or you did sleep but it was, it was a nightmare the whole time. So that's very hard, that's been very difficult. I, I still have many problems. PTSD is a real thing and I have it and I'm not embarrassed that I have it, but it, it is hard to live with, I tell you that. There are, there are quirks, I have new things that I can't do, things that I, I can't talk about or discuss. Um, like one thing, that I can tell you is like I, I um, Skolachki's, the store Skolachki's, you, it's a place you eat sandwiches. Well, I don't eat it anymore because for some reason m my dad was eating it a lot whenever, uh, right before he had passed and I can't help but think was that his last meal? And if that was, I, I can't bring myself to eat it. So I haven't ate Skolachki since he died. Um, I know that y'all probably seen it in my previous videos that we had. My son and my husband still eat it, but I won't eat it. So that's one thing. And then um, another thing is I won't cook chicken spaghetti. I made a really good chicken spaghetti uh, back before my dad had died. And that was one of his favorite meals for me to cook for him. And he had asked me to make chicken spaghetti the day before his surgery and I told him, you know, I'm working, I gotta make sure I have everything ready for my new job orientation tomorrow. Dad, I'll cook it for you <sighs> whenever you get home the next week after surgery. He never made it home. So I haven't cooked chicken spaghetti. I don't like seeing the anatomy of the heart. It gives me anxiety looking at it. I don't like seeing any type of blood. I That stuff used to not bother me at all and like I used to want to work in the ER and places like that but now I don't want to be a part of any of it and 
and nursing, as far as I'm concerned, it will not be my end career. This is not it. I have pretty much made up my mind that I do not want to do nursing for the rest of my life. I admire the nurses out there. We all do a very hard job, but it is not in my heart anymore to do it. I do it uh, now because that's what I have a license in and it doesn't, you know, it's fine. Home health is really good for me because it is one-on-one um, -on -one care. It's not fast-paced. You know, you do have your hard days whenever a patient gets sick or something like that, but as far as I'm concerned, it is good for me right now. But I do not see myself doing nursing for the rest of my life. I will probably switch to another career sooner or later. I'm looking out the window right now at my nine fixing to be ten year old son and I just can't imagine what would have happened. I guess I, I guess I wouldn't have imagined because I wouldn't have been here. I'm thankful. I am thankful for for everything. It has been the hardest year of my life, and somehow I made it out. And I know God was protecting me all through it, even whenever I felt like he wasn't, even whenever I was pissed off at him. <laughs> he protected me all throughout, and I know my dad is up there with him and he's in a way better place than he could have been down here I'm figuring it out day by day on who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing and what life is supposed to be what my calling is I don't have all the answers right now and it is not glamorous in any way shape or form I'm a regular person regular struggles in this, this wild ass life we live in so I completely forgot to tell y'all that I got a tattoo you see it it says made for more and it is a tattoo for my dad and pretty much to sum it up it's I feel some people are just made for more than what life had to offer them. I know most people believe like we're on this earth to find our soulmate and reproduce and die. I just feel like my dad was made for more than to just find his soulmate. He never found the person that he lived happily ever after with, but I feel like we were his happily ever after. I don't know. It's difficult to explain, but I got my first tattoo and it's for him and it means a lot to me. But I feel like he was just made for more. It is getting to be evening time. I need to get some laundry done. I need to cook dinner. And I need to spend some time with my family. So thank y'all for sticking around if you've stuck around for this long. Thank y'all for listening to me babble. Thank y'all for being here. Thank y'all for being my friends. That's, that's what y'all are to me. Y'all are my friends. And I needed y'all. I just want to let y'all know that. That I, I needed y'all. God sent y'all to me. He did. I 100% I believe that. There is not a doubt in my mind. Y'all were a part of whatever. Whatever this is. And whatever it is supposed to be. Y'all are a part of it. Sitting down to make this video. I had so much anxiety. And now I feel so peaceful getting it off my chest.
I'm gonna go out there and spend some time with my family before it gets dark. It's Sunday evening and I gotta go to work tomorrow. So until next time, love on your people, be kind to strangers, and know that you are God's child. I'll see y'all in the next one.